There's this one part of it that's slowly dying, but there's this new part that's slowly building. And I think that message resonates with artists. There's just so much abandoned and affordable property. Some people for $500 can reconstruct like a whole thing that they own and work out of. We've just about got the city under control now. The arts are that kind of savior. It's food for the soul. What you do kind of uh, radiates. You can see the rippling effect of what you have done. And I think that's where it, it becomes a very special place. They're so influenced by the architecture, the, the vast landscapes, the empty fields, the epic buildings, uh, all of these aesthetics that are of our landscape, and they find it to be very inspiring. The cops really aren't going to tell you no. They're busy with other things, you know. That's one good thing about the financial situation that the city, it's nothing new. It's always been in that to an extent. They don't have time to tell you no. And that makes for great art. The true artist comes out when the person is able to create for what they have. In other words, when you're down to whatever you have and you create, that's when the true artistry comes out. That rooster will totally attack us. It's really me. <laughs> the ducks are really cute. I originally came to Detroit through an art project with Juxtapose and Powerhouse. Everybody that went was just thrown into this like very interesting situation where they're like, you have total freedom to like play with walls or all of these abandoned houses as like an empty blank canvas to do whatever with, like build on, paint on. And the abandon there kind of just led to an automatic, like archiving all these treasures that you'd find in abandoned buildings. And I already pretty much only work with recycled materials, so it was kind of like a perfect fit to be constantly exploring and just finding all of these like materials and then getting to do whatever I wanted with them led to building the treasure nest and making a giant house that was an installation slash treasure trove, hence the name the treasure nest. Once we bought the house on Moran Street, many other friends started kind of living there and moving in and then now that whole block is like artists and musicians and different people that just like have made a home there. That's why I like collaborating so much is because you just challenge yourself and can kind of learn. You get to know people very intimately and you learn a lot about yourself and what you're capable of. Anytime I'm exploring, it's for fun, but it's also, I'm always just kind of on the lookout like for objects and things that are special, like interesting wood pieces of metal or like paper. Like a lot of times I'll go into buildings and just like make a installation just because it's fun. The point isn't even for people to see it, it's just to like move objects around when you find them and like just because. I have no idea what I'm going to do every day because it keeps changing and I kind of really am happy existing like that. It's good fig like getting surprised by yourself constantly. At this point, it's just like taking all the good and the bad and trying to do something productive with it. When uh, we first came here in 1994, this area was like any area in the city of Detroit where there's, there's no life, just desolate. So this started out as an, an African bead museum, but we ran out of money because the, the roof fell to the bottom of the building. So we said, we're not going to stop there. We'll just do what we can. So we had all this land back here available. So we started building installations and doing stuff and realized that this is more connected with what the people really need than anything else. So the first thing we did was to board these buildings up. And boarding the building up, I had this great idea of uh, painting some artwork on the corner. So I put the artwork on the corner, but it got such a, a huge amount of attention from the people. 
and then we had this field back here with all this debris and all this stuff left over from them redesigning Grand River. One day I was out there, I picked up one of the concrete slabs that had a rock protruding out of it. So I said, oh, iron teaching rocks how to rust. The first installation I built back there, I tagged it the iron school. Put some chairs around it. So now I'm at the genesis of this installation, which is iron teaching rocks how to rust, which is a, a metaphor dealing with the differences between two cultures from 500 years ago to the present. Africans and Europeans. The next installation I put up out there was a detention center. In the detention center, iron was rootless in its control of getting everyone to learn how to, to rust. And these were only the artists that they locked up. Iron artists, wood artists, and uh, rock artists. In this detention center, these folks had enough time to do a lot of research. And they discovered that just beneath the sur surface, they all were identical. Their differences were superficial. So they went to Iron and told Iron this information. Iron said, well, you know, we gotta consult with our people. And as Iron was consulting with their people, they began to argue and fight amongst themselves. The rocks escaped, moved to the land of wood, set up a school, and began to teach themselves how to rust. So the moral of that is that if you're an oppressed people, you need to be careful what you're teaching yourself. You may just be teaching yourself what your oppressor wants you to learn. In my uh, approach to doing art, I'm using some very uh, strong uh, tricks of the trade that our ancestors have always used, is use materials that the people are connected with, whether they know it or not. If any culture, uh, it's set up where the children learn from observation if you're trying to teach people change in the now, it's not going to work. The culture is already set up. The children uh, do stuff and they become whatever it is. So if we're trying to teach children to be good and not do certain things in the present, it's not going to work. Not to know is bad. Not to wish to know is worse. A lack of knowledge is darker than night. Malcolm Art Show 1999. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been uh, hanging out with Dimitro and Dobbles, and we've been making this documentary about them called Kisi Concord. You see that? They make pictures. I, I come up from Germany in 1950, uh, coming to Detroit. This time we were uh, making a car Hudson, long time ago. Uh, from Hudson I got to Jeremoth. And then I, I, <laughs> I tell myself what I can do. Uh, I like the television, aluminum. Yeah, he lived on a farm in the Ukraine, and then from there he ended up going to Germany where he happened to be there when World War II started. He was in a work camp for about five years, and that's actually where he met his wife. And from there, once they were liberated, they came to the United States and pretty much had the American dream, found their way to Detroit, and worked on the assembly line for pretty much his entire life. And then when he retired, he decided he needed to keep building something. So he looked to his backyard. And to him, he saw just this blank slate, and he began to construct a giant helicopter and a plane and everything else that you see out there. When I go from Terramoto, I retirement, then I do something for, for a garage. I make a first helicopter, then make a Concord. He 
constantly is renovating it. He's constantly maintaining it, creating new pieces. If he sees something in an alleyway somewhere that he sees potential, he'll pick it up. He'll take it home. He'll find a way to make it his own and he gets it in. There are very clear themes and stuff. Like there are so many things that are just repeated. Not like, like there are a million horses and a million fans and a million birds and all the missiles pointed at Russia and all the soldiers walking in the opposite direction. All of these, you know, people working in these idyllic folk situations that like are big parts of his childhood, but he'll never talk about that. I mean, I think his sense of like this scale of it and like the topics that it's sort of talking about is a, a subconscious expression of uh, his life. People that have grown up with Amtramic Disneyland love it. And a lot of time people who might have been kids in the 90s, they talk about how they now have families and they bring their kids to see it. And you know, it's something that, you know, I think is really tied into the neighborhood. A lot of people bring supplies to Davos or to Mitro. And I've heard from the people that give them things that then it kind of becomes interactive for them because they get to see what do they do with it. Oh, look. There's my horse, or there's my mannequin. To hear that kind of involvement and participation, maybe not in a direct sense, but in the sense of giving an object to see what they do with it, is really exciting.